And it occurred to me that I teach a seminar at the law school that I call Legal Systems Very Different from Ours, in which we start out by looking at modern gypsies, then Imperial China, uh, classical Athens, Saga period Iceland, the Cheyenne Indians, and a variety of other societies. And the basic idea is that all human societies face very roughly the same problems. They have solved them in an interesting variety of different ways, and you can learn something by studying the different ways in which different societies have, in fact, solved things. Uh, in one detail, which I won't go into, I like to claim that Iceland shows that the American legal system is a mere thousand years behind the cutting edge of legal technology, <laughs> since their legal system had a simple feature, which I argue would improve ours. Uh, and it occurred to me that if you're going to have a seastead, it's going to have some sort of a legal system, some mechanism by which disputes get, get resolved, by which rights get enforced. And that some of what I've learned from looking at a variety of historical legal systems might be useful for thinking about how a seastead would work. Uh, and in thinking about this, it seemed to me that there are really two possible environments for a seastead, which have rather different legal implications. The first one is inside the territorial waters of an existing state, where you are, in effect, under the sovereignty of an existing legal system. The second is out on the high seas, where you are trying to function as something like your own independent state, non-state, whatever it is. Uh, let me start with the first, because the first means that you have what I like to describe as an embedded legal system as a legal system for one society embedded in and in some sense subject to the existing legal system uh, of another. And there are, I think, three different models for how embedded legal systems work. The first and most familiar one is the one that we are under at this very moment because it is the way in which the legal system of a hotel works. The hotel has certain legal rights, such as the right to refuse to rent rooms to people, uh, under the overarching legal system, by exercising those rights, it can to some extent enforce its own rules. And uh, that's how universities work. Universities can have courts, they can have rules, they are, only res they are restricted in their punishments to things they can legally do, but they can nonetheless operate a legal system within that. Or to take a bigger example, that's the way the Mormons work, the Church of Latter-day Saints, no longer is an independent state since some difficulties back a hundred and some years ago, uh, but they nonetheless have their own courts and their own laws. And how can they enforce them? Well, they can legally forbid you from going into the temple. It's private property. And if you have broken enough of their rules and used to be a Mormon, they will forbid you from going into the temple and in various other ways punish you for breaking their rules. Uh, so that's a possible model. And you could certainly imagine a seastead that had its own rules or its own sets of different rules, all of them subject to the overarching rule of whatever state it was located within. If you want your seastead to have very strong rules, to have a, the equivalent of a strong legal system, you might want to have residents post a bond that will forfeit if they break the rules. If you want very least, loose rules, you might say all we can do is to kick you off, basically. Second model. Uh, is what I think of as the gypsy model. And the gypsy model is that you stay below the radar of the official legal system. So that legally speaking, of course, the laws of the country you're in apply to gypsies too. But gypsies have a tendency to treat identi identities as fungible property. So George Smith was him last week, but it's useful that George Smith should be you next week. And Gypsies aren't going to testify against other gypsies, and it's hard to keep track of people. Maybe that will cease working with bio-identification in the future. But in the past, it's worked pretty well uh, as a system in which gypsies, in practice, could evade a good deal of the surrounding legal system, could keep their kids out of the public schools, for example, uh, while at the same time using basically the threat of ostracism as a mechanism for controlling their own people. Uh, I think that system is breaking down gradually in the US and Canada because we're too tolerant. And when a society is tolerant, the threat of ostracism becomes less effective. Uh, but that would be another story. 
But in any case, we could certainly imagine a seastead, especially one under the sovereignty of a country that wasn't paying much attention to it, or wasn't very competent, or where you could pay off a few people appropriately, where you could de facto be a sovereign nation, even though you were de jure subject to someone else. Uh, the third model is what I think of as the Ottoman model, since that's a particularly famous and large example of doing it. Uh, the Ottoman term was a millet. And the basic idea was the Ottomans were perfectly happy to subcontract the job of enforcing the law to communities within the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottomans would say to the Jews of some area or some particular Christian sect, what we want from you is the following taxes each year. And no trouble. And subject to that, we are willing to let you rule your own people, to enforce your rulings, and so forth. And you could, again, certainly imagine a future seastead where the seastead basically made a deal with some nation. And the deal with that nation is, yes, you are under our law, but one of the terms of our law is that you get to make your own law for your own people. And one of the reasons it might be easier for a seastead to get that deal than for other people to get that deal is that seasteads are mobile, and therefore, to some extent, they can play off different nations against each other by saying, if you give us a better deal, we'll move into your territorial waters, and you'll collect some taxes from us and get some other advantages, so maybe you ought to give us a better deal than they would. So those, it seems to me, are the three plausible models if you're imagining an embedded legal system as seasteading, uh, which I think you might very possibly uh, end up with. Uh, and the third model, the millet model, the Ottoman model, looks rather like what I want to get into next, which is the high seas model, where you really are uh, an independent uh, and, and, sovereign, and sovereign state. Uh, and a full discussion of that model, of how you might want to design a legal system for a independent seasteading nation, which I'm imagining is a whole bunch of seasteads clustered together. Uh, I wasn't quite sure whether you should use seastead for the individual raft or for the conglomeration, but I have checked with my familial authority, and I'm told that the individual raft is called a seastead, and the agglomeration is called something else. And I don't know what. Uh, but awesome. if you, what? That's awesome. We hope, depends. It might be a very small agglomeration. Uh, but in any case, uh, if you imagine that story on the high seas, and if we imagine you've somehow solved the problem of other nations seizing you, and you're doing an adequate job of discouraging pirates and whatever else, and you're now thinking about how do we have rules to settle issues among the people living here. And I think the first issue you want to think about in setting up a legal system is mono or poly. And no, I don't mean that kind of poly. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of poly-legal versus mono-legal systems. That we're used to thinking of a model of a legal system where within some territory everybody's under the same law. And that isn't really quite true even for the modern American legal system because to some degree disputes after all aren't always territorial. Not all disputes have a legal location. You may have a contract which says that certain disputes will be decided under the law of the state of Delaware. And your neighbor may have a contract which says that similar disputes will be decided under the law of the state of Washington. So to some limited degree, even in our society, different people are under different legal systems. But historically, it's gone much farther than that. that as some of you may know, Sunni Muslims recognize four different orthodox schools of law. They're mutually orthodox in that none of them calls the other a heretic, but they disagree on the implications for the legal system of the commonly recognized religious sources. And at least in the Middle Ages, a large uh, Muslim city would have had four different court systems, one for each of those. It would very possibly have had a court system for the Jews, a court system for the Christians, a court system for the Shia. Uh, a multiple court systems where, in effect, each of the communities within that of people who had things in common would settle their disputes by their legal rules with some mechanism, and it's not entirely clear what it always was, for deciding what happened when you had a case between two people from different such communities. Similarly, I gather that it wasn't until something like 15 or 1600 that Welsh in Wales were under English law. 
that for a considerable period after Wales was conquered, Welsh in Wales were under Welsh law, English in Wales were under English law. And similarly, during the Reconquista, the, the process by which the Spanish stamped out civilization in Iberia, uh, when a Muslim village had been conquered by the Christians, the normal deal was that they got to keep Muslim law at least for a century or so. Uh, eventually, they got absorbed entirely, but not entirely. So those are all examples of polylegal systems uh, historically, uh, and there are others. Some of you have read my book, The Machinery of Freedom, in which, among other things, I tried to sketch out what a society with private property and trade but without government might look like. And what I described there was a system in which individuals were the customers of enforcement agencies. And the enforcement agencies recognized that one of their customers might think his rights have been violated by another agency's customers, and that raises obvious problems, and therefore it's in the interest of the enforcement agencies to contract in advance with each other to specify the private courts that will settle such disputes. Uh, and that then is in fact a polylegal system, as uh, I think my friend Jeff Hummel was the first one I remember pointing out that my model of anarchy was very different from the pre-existing competing model of anarcho-capitalism in which there was a single consensus legal system. In mine, legal systems are competing, uh, and there is at least some tendency for people to say, well, the reason I will be a customer of this agency is that the court they use to settle disputes among their customers is one I like, that it has legal rules that I want to live under, and furthermore, they've done a pretty good job of negotiating to get legal rules with other people uh, that I'm happy to live under. So you have a sort of a market pressure towards generating optimal legal rules. And people who are interested in that question, the book is still in print, uh, and you can, can read it there. But it occurred to me, and this is really a point reinforced by some of the things Patry was saying in his uh, talk, uh, that a seastead raises a particularly interesting version of this kind of system. Because you could have a seastead which, I mean, one of the thing, one of the ways you might populate your seasteads, I'm not sure you will, is as a sort of a collection of different kinds of nuts. Uh, <laughs> that is to say, groups of people who don't get along very well with the existing consensus system. So one could imagine a seastead where the, or not a seastead, a conglomeration, where these four seasteads belong to members of the FLDS, the polygamist Mormons, and those five were uh, Wicca, and those three over there were crazy libertarians, some of whom took drugs and some of whom didn't, uh, and so forth and so on. You can go on. And in that kind of a model, it would make a lot of sense to say, well, each of those subgroups, probably several seasteads each, but not the whole conglomeration, has its own rules, just as Pottery was describing for ephemeral. It's sort of the, the large, larger scale version of that. And then, just as with my version of anarcho-capitalism, the problem arises with the cross cases, just as with the other cases I've mentioned. So what happens when there is a dispute between a fundamentalist uh, LDS member and a Wicca member, and they have minor religious disagreements, which might lead to different opinions about what rights and duties people have with regard to each other. Uh, or to take the sort of simplest case, uh, kind that arises in college dormitories all the time, what happens if Pottery's agglomeration has people who like heavy metal music played very loudly, whereas my agglomeration has peaceful sorts of people who don't like music interrupting our World of Warcraft expeditions. <laughs> uh, and in my original model of anarcho-capitalism, really the default rule. What happens if you can't reach agreement is you fight each other. All right? That's not a very nice default rule. The reason I expect that, that rights enforcement agencies will sign contracts is in order to avoid that outcome. But there's no guarantee in the world, uh, and maybe you'll have people shooting each other sometimes. And one of the really neat things about the seasteading model is that you have a much simpler default rule, that if we really, after all the arguments, can't reach agreement, on some common court or some rule to settle disputes between members of my agglomeration and your agglomeration, one of us calls a tugboat. Uh, 
and our, one of the agglomerations, which everyone is feeling worst about the situation, gets pulled out, one of the sub-agglomerations, my five seasteads move out of the agglomeration far enough so I can't hear his damn music. Uh, that solves that problem. And of course, over time, because of the fluidity of the seasteading architecture, as it were, I don't have to limit myself to my five seasteads because I'm going to find out by online conversations that there are four other seasteads 3,000 miles south of us, which also pulled out because of that damn heavy metal music. <laughs> and meanwhile, the FLDS people who pulled out of a seastead uh, up in the Pacific, I'm not quite sure if we can pull seasteads through the canal. It's going to be a little difficult, but with global warming, the Northwest Passage is opening up. Or, <laughs> and the, the Northeast Passage has already opened up, as you may know. It's been got used this year. So uh, there are going to be four FLDS seasteads, and there are these, these odd people uh, who, who have somewhat more restrictive marital system than the FLDS. They only allow four wives. And they didn't get along with their seastead either because most of the Muslim world isn't very high tech. And so they were a small minority on their seastead somewhere in the Mediterranean. They wanted to get not too far from Jerusalem. Uh, and so the Mus fundamentalist Muslims and the fundamentalist LDS can get towed together. And with luck, they can work out a common set of rules. So you could imagine over time uh, a system in which individual sort of sub-agglomerations have their own legal systems and can clump with similar ones, thus minimizing, not eliminating, but minimizing the problems that come from the cross-law conflicts that are going to evolve, going to, going to arise in any polylegal system. Uh, and after all, of course, the world as a whole is a polylegal system. And the standard solution to the problem, which everybody is used to, is geographically distinct legal areas. And what happens when you can't reach an agreement on a border? Well, you have a war. That's the same breakdown situation as under anarcho-capitalism. It's just that it's likely to happen a lot more often on historical evidence with the <coughs> standard system than with the competitive system, because the standard system has funds coming from a captive market, whereas the uh, anarcho-capitalist competitive system, the funds depend on your having customers who are willing to pay for what you're offering them, and if what you're offering them is a free fire zone, they may not be too willing to pay for it. Uh, so in any case, those were the main points that occurred to me. Now I have a few more minutes left if my watch is right, and so there were two other points I wanted to mention. One of them is in setting up a particular legal system, whether, whether you go back to a mono-legal system for your whole conglomeration, or whether you're imagining one of the sub-ones, one of the interesting questions is how you get the rules enforced. Because we're used to thinking of a rather radical, on the whole, pretty modern model, in which the way you get rules enforced is you have professional enforcers called policemen and public prosecutors. And it's their job to arrest people, to prosecute them, and so forth. But in fact, the modern legal systems we live under are actually two legal systems. Uh, our legal system is redundant, a point not often mentioned, because we've got a system called criminal law, which works the way I just described, and a system called tort law, in which all of the, everything except the, except the final stage of collecting the judgment is being done privately. That is to say, the victim of a tort is the one who <coughs> collects the evidence, figures out who ran into his car, he or his lawyer prosecutes the case. If there's a settlement, it's between private parties. So we actually have a world with one system called criminal law, one called tort law, one publicly prosecuted, one privately prosecuted. If you look historically, private prosecution of what we think of as criminal law is actually a very, very common system. If you look at classical Athens, for example, which is a wonderful legal system invented by mad economists, some of it, uh, the impression of a lot of smart people, some of whose ideas worked and some of whose didn't. Uh, or if you look at England as late as the 18th century, where criminal law was nominally the king versus so-and-so, but the king didn't have any lawyers working for him, and the actual cases were being prosecuted by the victims. Uh, and if you look at many, many other historical legal systems over time, what you observe is a system where you have some set of rights. The rights mean either in the tort model that the victim of an offense has a claim against the offender, and he goes through the legal procedure to get that claim uh, 
implemented, or in a cr privately enforced criminal model, which is the 18th century English one, anybody has a claim against an offender because I saw you do such and such, which is an offense, and anybody who wants can prosecute him, and some of the fine the offender pays if convicted goes to the prosecutor if successful. I mentioned classical Athens. Uh, one of the obvious problems with the system I've just described uh, is the temptation to make up crimes that rich people you've decided are guilty of and prosecute them in the hope of getting some money out of it or of getting paid off to drop it. And the Athenians were aware of this problem. The Athenians had big juries. And one of their legal rules was that if the prosecutor did not get at least 30% of the jurors to vote for conviction, the prosecutor was fined. <laughs> Uh, have a few, couple more minutes. Let me give you as a puzzle my other, other favorite bit of Athenian law. The Athens had this very straightforward way of producing what we think of as public goods. And the rule was that if you were one of the richest Athenians, every other year you had to produce a public good. So one of the magistrates comes to you and he says, you know, you may have heard we're sending a team to the Olympics this year. Congratulations, you're the sponsor. <laughs> Or you see that lovely trireme down at the deck. Guess who's in charge of her this year? And there were two ways of getting out of it. And one of the ways of getting out of it was to show that either this year or last year you already had done such a thing, because you only had to do it once every other year. The other way was to show that there was another Athenian who was richer than you were, who wasn't doing one this year, hadn't done one last year, and therefore he should do it instead of you. So my puzzle is, how in a world without accountants, without bank accounts, without the IRS, how do I, one Athenian, prove that you, another Athenian, are richer than I am? And if you've heard the answer, you're not allowed to give it. Uh, <laughs> but if you haven't heard the answer, I will leave it to you as a puzzle, and I will give you a minute and a half now to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question in general. And when I originally described this, the argument I offered was that we don't observe that law enforcement is cheaper and, and better in large cities than in small towns. Now, there are a lot of other differences as well. But it's not clear to me that there are very large returns to scale. But that's obviously an empirical question, and it would be different at different times with different technologies and so forth. It depends partly what you imagine the agencies are doing. You know, if they're uh, running patrols through the neighborhood, then there's a, not exactly a return to scale, but a return to concentration. You want to have lots of customers in one place. If what they're doing is installing cameras and then following up the results of what those cameras show who was breaking into your house, then it doesn't really matter if they're all together or, or spread out. Uh, so, but I think the real answer is that whether, whether, whether the equilibrium is large or small is going to be an empirical, empirical question. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I think my web page has got some other things I've written on this in addition to Machinery of Freedom, which is not on the web page because my publisher won't let me web it, uh, but uh, including a book chapter on anarchy and efficient law where I think I may discuss that. I know in a couple of places I've looked, I, I thought about the question of what would or wouldn't lead to economies of scale. And if you want, we could talk about that more later. But it's not, yes? How would extraditions work in a world of these things? Extraditions? Not just between these things, but between within Within these things. I think the answer is that would be a a question of the contracts between the different sub-agglomerations, that uh, that would be one of the things to be negotiated, whether or not you allowed extradition. And would these have negotiation with nation states? Maybe. 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 Yeah. Maybe or maybe not. Yes. Um, one of the things we take as a sort of cultural constant is one of the things we want from our enforcement systems is um, for them to apply universally. Right? So we, we, we it, a lot of people enjoy being under a system where they understand that what, what they want is going to be enforced by everyone else. Is that actually, do you, in your sort of study of historical legal systems, is that something that, that people in um, 
uh, poly systems uh, have, have objected to in their systems that someone else is treated unfairly because they're under a different legal system? Or is that a, a relatively new idea? I would think of it as sort of a modern foolish prejudice, yeah. Uh, the, I, mean, I haven't really looked in, into the question, but I certainly don't remember any impression that, that people had, had, had that reaction. And of course, what's wrong with the modern attitude is that the assumption is always that we're all going to be treated by the right rules. But if you say instead, look, we're unsure what the right rule, even putting aside the problem of how you define the right rule, even suppose you said somewhere written in the sky there is a just legal system. Well, if it was really clear to read, then everybody would have the same legal system, no problem. Once you concede that there are difficulties reading what's written in the sky, that reasonable people will disagree about the rules, then the answer to, well, if this is the right rule, shouldn't it be the right rule for everybody? You say, yeah, but what if it's the wrong rule? Do you want it to be the wrong rule for everybody? Aren't we better off with a world where different guesses about the right, world, right rule get implemented for different people? And to some degree, we can learn something by looking at how the different guesses of what the rule ought to be uh, are working out for different countries or different subgroups within countries. Yeah. Ah, uh, marketable tort claims. It's a system in which there is no criminal law, in which if you kill someone, his relatives sue you. And one of the obvious problems with such a system is what if the victim of the tort is poor and can't afford a lawyer in modern terms, which in Icelandic terms really means doesn't have any friends who will fight for him and is therefore likely to get beaten up on the way to the court, so to speak. Uh, it's not that the trial itself was theoretically a fight, but, on, but only that the threat of violence exists always in the background. Uh, and you can see that in the sagas. Uh, and their solution to that is I'm a poor old fellow and my son got killed by some people and it's perfectly clear who did it and it's clear that they owe me 200 ounces of silver under the existing rules, but how will I collect? Well, that's all right. My next door neighbor has four tough sons who went a Viking in their youth and might go again and everybody knows about them and they've got friends and relatives. I transfer the claim to him and we split the 200 silver. Or we don't, depending how hard it's gonna to be to collect, but it's up to us to make it. Paying for enforcement. Well, not paying for enforcement, being able to sell your tort claim to someone else to collect. So if you imagine that you're somebody in a modern society and your car has been tortiously injured by another person's car, you don't really know what lawyer can best collect for you. If you can't afford a lawyer and you're doing it with a contingency fee, you don't know what lawyer you should go with, so you auction off the claim. Whatever law firm offers you the highest price is the one that's gonna do the best job of collecting for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, that was David Friedman.